Thank you very much. Thank you to ERA and to the organizers of this particular session for inviting me again. And it's always a pleasure to be able to meet different officials that come from regulatory authorities or from the law dealing with these issues in a number of EU and Eurozone countries. I'm also glad that I'm not asked to talk about Brexit in the, in the last few weeks whenever I have been invited to conferences abroad notably in the U.S., have been invited to talk about the effects that Brexit will have on financial integration in Europe, which, as you know, is, um, well, you will have a session tomorrow, but it's often an exercise in futurology, since formal <laughs> negotiations have not even commenced, even if there are a variety of models, a variety of opinions, as well as a great deal of legal and economic uncertainty. But the issue have been asked to address is also a complex issue, not, not, not as complex as Brexit, but it's a complex issue and it's a new issue. And the way I'm going to discuss, I mean, what do we have to learn from the other side of the Atlantic? I hope also again that when we get to the questions and answers, you don't get into any political questions. I th again, it's futurology, what will happen to the regulatory agenda in the US. So I will focus on the status quo as we have now as well, as well as some of the trends. So one of the things that the financial crisis, the financial crisis taught us many things. And one of the things that the financial crisis uh, taught us is that we had some pre-existing conceptions about systemic risk that were actually wrong. We used to think that systemic risk was associated with banking and with size. And though that remains true, and the too big to fail remains true, the financial crisis also t taught us that systemic risk has to do with more than banking. It also has to do with securities, with insurance, with derivatives. It has to do with other markets beyond banking. And it has to do with more than size. It has to do with interconnectedness. It has to do with complexity. It has to do with this new test of significance, which is applied differently in the, across the two sides of the Atlantic. And also it taught us in this new understanding of systemic risk that we have a so-called, and this has been termed by some economists working on the subject, a composition fallacy. A composition fallacy, as I'm sure you know, contains that the safety and soundness of the financial system is the aggregate soundness of all its individual participant institutions. So this fallacy assumed that if individual entities were strong, then the whole system would be resilient. But the assumption proved to be misguided. And I remember I had, um, I had the great opportunity of being a specialist advisor to the House of Lords in the United Kingdom, though I'm Spanish. I, I, I was um, appointed as, as an expert at that time. I don't know if I will continue to be appointed as an expert now. And the, the discussion was the, uh, the, the scrutiny of, of you know, what had caused the financial crisis, were the responses adequate. And one of the people that came to give evidence was Jacques de la Rosière, the author of the famous report that gave rise to the ESAS. And remember that. He, he talked very much about this, is that we thought that individual entities were adequately capitalized. And they were, according to whether it was Basel I in the US, Basel II was never fully implemented, or Basel II. But we failed to see that the system as, as a whole was hugely undercapitalized and over leveraged. So using an analogy with forest <laughs> management, the safeguard of the health of the forest requires a different strategy and the safeguard of the health of each individual tree. This analogy, of course, is, as all analogies, when one applies them to finance, is incomplete and insufficient. But it gives, it gives us um, a view of one of the things that went wrong. Because clearly, inadequate systemic risk control was one of the features of the crisis. And now, as a response, not the only response, because there are also other responses we have, enhanced microprudential supervision, enhanced regulation of capital requirements, new liquidity requirements, resolution, which will be discussed and has already been discussed, strategies. 
So we have a, a large number of supervisory and regulatory initiatives. But the one that is uh, embraced now by financial authorities and is relatively novel, even if, as I will explain to you, it draws on existing techniques often, is macroprudential <coughs> supervision. So what I'm going to do to, to take us through this subject, and uh, feel free to interrupt me, not necessarily at the end, is if through the presentation you feel that some point is not clear, is first some definitional issues. I have done in my life a lot of interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary research. In the field of central banking and financial regulation, where I've been doing research, teaching, and consulting over the last 20 years, it's important that we have a meaningful dialogue between law and economics. And one of the things that the law always provides is the logical coherence, a conceptual framework. So using that framework, which I think helps us understand economic issues, I will first discuss some definitions So, what do we mean by financial stability, what do we mean by systemic risk, what do we mean by micro and macro prudential supervision, what's the difference in the contours between the two, and then once that we have established some platform, terminological platform, I will then be looking at the different solutions. The solution in the US, <coughs> as you know, is a council, Financial Stability Oversight Council, to which I will be referring, which is not placed in the central bank, which is mm. placed as a compound of regulatory authorities and is actually headed by the Secretary of the Treasury. And the solution adopted on the side of the Atlantic, which is either to put it in the bank in the central bank, like in the case of the Bank of England, or to divide it, as we do with regard to macro pru, as I will. Macro pru is how economists refer now to macro prudential supervision, so I even entitled the presentation macro pru. Or how is macro pru in the EU Eurozone? And these days, everything in the EU Eurozone is complex. So macro pru in the Eurozone is complex arrangement, and it's not just the European Systemic Risk Board, Article 5 of the SSM regulation gives competences to the European Central Bank. And then we have the very important National Councils for Financial Stability that have been set up and will continue to be set up in the different member states of the EU. So this is the view of the forest and the view of the tree. My imperfect analogy to try to come to terms of what's the difference between macro and micro. Sometimes, as in action, Geloni has said, it's a different in approach. So in macro pru, you look more at the market as a whole, and obviously in micro pru, you look more at each individual institution. First, the definition of financial stability. A very long slide to conclude that there is not such thing as a commonly accepted definition of financial stability. If you compare, if you look at financial stability from the perspective of being a central banking goal, which it is, is much more than that, but it's also a central banking goal, in the past, central banks, in the recent past, up until the crisis, during the, the model that was adopted with the Maastricht Treaty and was adopted also in a number of other jurisdictions around the world, the, the model was very simple. We had the central bank, and which was one agency, in charge of one primary objective, which is price stability, and with one key function or key instrument, which was monetary policy, understood in the, in the old, conventional, traditional way as management of interest rates. In the new world that we live now after the crisis, when financial stability was overlooked, as Professor Charles Goodhart, maestro and mentor in my economic studies, often <coughs> likes to remind his audiences these days when he talks about these issues, none of the macro models that central banks used included banks and credit flows. That's how much financial stability was ignored up to the crisis. And it really, the instability, which is what we know very well, so we, sometimes it's difficult to define stability in, 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 in positive terms, but we all know what instability in negative terms is. So it was clear that financial instability had been caused by having ignored or overlooked a number of issues. And this number of issues or kind of grouped together in the first bullet point. So what's financial stability? 
if, if we were to give a, a, a legal definition and considering that economists still have not agreed on a measure of what the stability is, and indeed there is a whole range from people that think there should be resilience, and they say it should never be the stability of the graveyard, you know, you don't want to completely kill risk management, to people that say it should be a greater degree of stability, but it's a broad and discretionary concept that refers to the safety and soundness of the financial system. There appears to be broad agreement that it does refer to this. It always encompasses one way or the other, the smooth operation of the payment system, but it's more than that. It's the, also the resilience of the financial system, and this you will see in a number of reports from central banks, as financial stability councils and others, resilience of the financial system to withstand unforeseen shocks, very, very broad. But in negative terms, it's, it's easier to understand. Financial stability is the essence of instability and crisis. And I put there in, 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 in a small um, uh, font, financial stability, systemic risk, contagion, control, and sound banking and finance, or close cousins, they're all part of the same family. So the literature before the crisis, sometimes we talk about contagion and safe and sound banking. After the crisis, you will hear much more issues like financial stability, macroprudential supervision, but they are cousins. And then, so <coughs> macroprudential supervision has to do with financial stability, has to do, financial stability has to do with the prevention of systemic risk, as well as the containment. And systemic risk, as we all know, refers to the risk or the probability of breakdown of the entire financial system as opposed to the breakdown of individual parts or components. But again, like with financial stability, a widely accepted definition is still missing. And indeed, as I started my presentation, this definition is changing, it's a moving target. It used to say that the difference between banking and securities regulation is that banking was much more concerned about systemic risk than securities is. After the crisis, though of course, investor protection, <coughs> disclosure and conduct, as well as efficiency of markets remain very important considerations of securities regulation. Securities regulators are also concerned these days about systemic risk. Um, and that's why there is a new understanding of systemic risk. The crisis showed that securities and derivatives markets, that institutions such as AIG, investment banks such as Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers were clearly systemic, and they were not commercial banks. The, uh, Another complication in systemic risk, and this is important to understand the domain of macroprudential supervision, is that systemic risks are not bounded by jurisdictional frontiers. They have a tendency to spread across geographical borders. So clearly, when you look at Lehman Brothers, the, the, the systemic effect of it was that it was just not contained to the US, was the cross-border effect. And with AIG, clearly, through the exposure of the CDS, as well as other issues, the issue was not simply content to the jurisdiction. At the regional level, when there is financial instability, whether it's in the Asian crisis, or in recent episodes, whether regional or international, it's clear like a tsunami, episodes of instability because of the interconnectedness of markets, sometimes derivative exposures and others, they are not contained to the domestic jurisdiction. So if the councils of financial stability just look at financial stability in the context of the domestic jurisdiction. They will not be doing a complete job. They will just be looking at one aspect of the job. And that's why I'm already advancing one of my conclusions is that there needs to be very close coordination between the different types of financial stability or committees or councils that we have set up. Uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis in the UK, when they did a report, which was the run on the rock, commissioned by the House of Commons, one of the conclusions was that, that there was, you know, both, a, in, in the feeling that there was an overlap, effectively what there was was an underlap. There was no entity that was clearly in charge of the problems of Northern Rock. And this is something, and one of the lessons that they had is that you need to have very close coordination between <coughs> the different authorities. So going forward, it's very important that we have close coordination between the committees. And uh, also, just to make matters more complicated, uh, there are a variety of instruments that can help achieve the goal of financial stability. So you have regulation, supervision, macro and micro, lender of large resort, crisis management, monetary policy, fiscal support. 
So again, if one compares what I refer to as the Bundesbank model before the crisis in which the central bank had monetary policy as the key instrument in the pursuit of price stability, after all, that's what the Maastricht Treaty says, after the crisis, we are moving to a world in which financial stability is as important as price stability, coexist on the same level, even if the treaty cannot change what is written in the treaty unless we amend the treaty. But the instruments to achieve financial stability <coughs> are much more or broader and much more complicated. It's not just monetary policy, it's more. The, the Basel Committee in the amendments to core principles eight and nine have also recognized, and I'm not going to read this very long slide, but has recognized the importance of macroprudential supervision as an important part of doing effective supervision. So let's go a little bit to the difference between macro and micro before we go into the actual models on the two sides of the Atlantic. Yeah, the tree and the forest, but this is the first imperfection of my distinction. Some trees are systemic. So clearly AIG was just one institution, but was systemic. So some entities are so important that they are CFIS, systemically important financial institutions. Another definitional issue is that macro pru sits between monetary policy and micro supervision. So when I advise the House of Lords in, in this report, the report actually established this definition of the different focus of micro and macro. But since then, I have to say that also the, the, the debate has actually moved on. And it is true that it, it sits between, I mean, the late Tommaso Padua Schiopa, uh, who was, as you know, a member of uh, very distinguished Italian economists have had very important uh, positions in, 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 in the European financial arena as well as in European Central Bank. And he said that financial stability and, and, and macro pru as an instrument, he didn't refer to macro pru, sits in between monetary policy and micro prudential supervision and supervision. So he called financial stability a land in between. And I always like to see that land in between because really macro pru sits between monetary policy and micro supervision and it's important to understand. The other complicating factor to understand macro pru is that it relies as upon many of the instruments which are typically used by the micro supervisory authorities, for instance, capital requirements, as well as other central bank instruments, for instance, the provision of lender of large resort. And that led Ignacio Angeloni, who as you know currently sits in the supervisory board of the SSM at the ECB, it is the logic of their use and the, and the scope of their application that is different. A further complication to understand macro pru is that certainly in the context of the Eurozone, many of the measures that have been taken, not just in the Eurozone, also in the context of the, of the Bank of England, many of the measures that have been taken is actually to look at the untouchable, the housing market, you know, the, the, the real estate market, but particularly the housing market. So, what, what the lesson is there is that though we have uh, now, with, certainly within the Eurozone, a single microprudential supervision with some exceptions, as we know money laundering and consumer protection have not been transferred to the SSM, but we have unified microprudential supervision. We do not have unified macroprudential supervision because to begin, asset markets are not homogeneous across the member states and in the Eurozone, for the foreseeable future, one, the one should aim for a single Eurowide macroprudential policy in order to respond to heterogeneous needs in the housing market, the macroprudential policy should also be heterogeneous. Think about loan to value ratio or loan to income ratio. I'm not going to go so much into the dimensions of macroprudential supervision, but again, it's important to understand that is a concept whose contours are not so crystal clear, you know, it, it expands. So this comes from a BIS publication talking about horizontal interdependence and connections, vertical, the criticality of certain institutions, temporal, economic cycle, very important in the case of the housing market, legal, gaps, overlaps, inconsistencies, procyclicality, and then international, very important one, the external risk in the global. I'll not go uh, through microprudential supervision, but just, just to say that up until the crisis, when people talk about supervision, was microprudential supervision. And again, microprudential supervision is, is, is in my opinion, uh, a, a rather broad process that encompasses everything from authorization to 
the beginning of crisis management, in some cases, median of crisis management, and in some other cases, end of crisis management. So, um, and also to remind us that supervision is very resource and personnel intensive, litigious, prone to reputational damage. See, if you do things well working for a supervisory agency, no one credits you very much. Maybe your boss gives you, you know, a pat in the back and say, well done. You would be lucky if you get some sort of monetary compensation. But if you do things minimally bad when it comes to supervision, immediately the, the press will actually be after the agency. So one of the things that obviously the ECB has taken on by assuming supervision is the reputational risk that comes with exercising supervision. But anyway. So having defined the theme, what are the solutions that have been adopted? So these, these different solutions, these different institutional solutions, and there are a number of reports that the IMF, the BIS, and you know, some, several central banks like the Fed and the Bank of England have published about what is the best institutional arrangement to deal with systemic risk control. It's clear that it has many dimensions. So it's clear that it's a central banking goal, but it's more than that. But some the solutions are kind of be divided into two groups. Those that put uh, the, 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 the macro prudential function in the central bank, and those that consider the central bank, the central bank can never be ignored. Whenever you talk about financial stability, you ignore the central bank at your own peril, or the central bank ignores the tax at its own peril. So central banking and financial stability, by definition, there is a link between the two by the very functions that the central bank exercises as lender of last resort, as bank as bank, as overseer of the payment system, as monetary policy, eh, as in being in charge of monetary policy, eh, they, they are clearly interconnected. But we said financial stability is more than that. So in a way, the solution in the US, the Dodd-Frank Act in the US by creating the Financial Stability Oversight Council, acknowledges this reality that central bank it transcends institutional mandates. It's a goal for the central bank, but it's also a goal for the supervisory agencies. It's even a goal for the treasury, because clearly we know with supervision at the end of the supervisory spectrum is crisis management. Crisis management implies resolution, and at the end, if things go very bad and we don't have sufficient uh, uh, funds or we feel we cannot close the institution, we have the involvement of taxpayers' money, and therefore the government, the Treasury, the Minister of Finance, needs to be involved. It kind of all makes sense. But so these are the two solutions. So we either have it in the central bank, like the Bank of England, which has the Financial Policy Committee, or we set up a new council overarching all agencies, all regulatory agencies, or we have a mix, like we have in the Eurozone. And I'll come back to the mix, because I'm not very happy with the mix, but that's what we have. Like with so many things in Europe, you may not be very happy with what we have, but that's what we have. So, um, so, and then uh, to, towards the end, I, I would like to emphasize that the key issue to me is coordination. Given this tsunami effect of instability, this tsunami effect of systemic risk, and that macro proof has to do a lot with that, coordination between these, and not just coordination, also with the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, and the IMF, to identify macroeconomic trends that can have a negative impact on, on financial markets, to me is crucial. And it's important to emphasize that, uh, particularly if you have a National Council of Financial Stability, that though your outlook on your jurisdictional domain will be the nation uh, to which you, know, you, you have been granted that mandate, the effects will actually uh, uh, affect other, not just other markets, will affect other jurisdictions. <coughs> so let's just look at the models here. So this is the model of the Bank of England. So uh, the model of the Bank of England has, and, and there are a number of legislative changes that have taken place since 2009. The Bank of England, as well as FISMA, has been amended several times. But is the recognition that uh, what this chart does and so is the MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee, that together with the MPC, which is in charge of monetary policy, what we need is an FPC, Financial Policy Committee, which is in charge of financial stability. Here you can see that it contributes to the bank's objective to protect and enhance financial stability by identifying and taking action to remove or reduce systemic risk 
with a view to protecting and enhancing the resilience of the UK financial system. Here you see the different concepts I mentioned at the beginning, resilience, systemic risk, and what the FPC does is macro proof, macro prudential supervision. The FPC also has powers of recommendation and direction over the other two key authorities that have been set up to deal, one with, uh, with prudential supervision, which is the PRA, and the other, the FCA. So the FCA, the Financial Service Authority, divided its mandate between these. The FCA uh, is in charge of conduct and consumer protection. And when it comes to investment firms and, and, and the ones there that are exchanges, it is also in charge of the prudential aspects of those entities. So you, this is the new thing. And the Bank of England is directly in charge of the prudential regulation of FMIs, the financial market infrastructure, all the CCPs, all the plumbing of the system. So the Bank of England directly. But all these, you see, all these has an impact on financial stability. So the regulation of the financial market infrastructures under resolution, which is the latest name in the game in resolution, the prudential regulation, the conduct regulation has also prudential aspects. And, you know, if when you talk to people in the FCA, that's one of the concerns that they have. And when you're talking prudential, at the end, at the top of prudential, you have systemic, and on the top of systemic, you have this financial stability and macro proof. So that's the model in the, U, in the UK. This is the model in the US. The, the title of my presentation saying lessons learned from the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, I'm not sure if many lessons can be learned, but uh, uh, at least I'm going to present the, the model that they have in the US. And, 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 and then I will perhaps leave it to you whether there are any lessons to be learned from that model. So this, this is a kind of a chart that shows to you that how, you know, very estilized, uh, still obviously U.S. Congress will be in charge, like in, in other, <coughs> in any national system, Parliament will always be in charge of enacting the key laws. And then it has this kind of macro prudential regulation and supervision. So it's a chart that tries to emphasize the centrality that has Financial Stability Oversight Council in, in the new system. And Financial Stability Oversight Council, it includes the heads of all the main supervisory agencies of the US. So the ones that you have below, the uh, Commodities and Futures Trading Commission, the FDIC, the most important one, the Federal Reserve System, the OCC, the Office of the Controller of the Currency, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, and as well as the uh, um, other entities which are, do not appear here, plus the Treasury, uh, also some state uh, regulators have a chair in the Financial Stability Oversight Council. So the idea of the Financial Stability Oversight Council in the US is to look at financial stability coming from banking, securities, insurance, commodities, derivatives, from the whole financial sector. And the reason why the Treasury sits on the top is because at the end of the day, if government funds need to be involved, is the fiscal support. And the fiscal support is nothing but as taxpayers. So it will become, it will have a fiscal implication. And that's why the government can never be ignored when one talks about either macro proof, financial stability, resolution, or any other crisis management instrument. This is a more complex uh, graph that actually shows to you where, where, how the system is in the US. You see, um, I, Remember that when I went to the U.S. a long, long time ago to study, I did my LLM in Harvard Law School, and I had um, a, a professor there that said one of the things that certainly is not to be copied elsewhere is the complexity of the U.S. system. But this is exactly what we've done in Europe. You know, we have created our own complexity. So that's what I'm saying, are these lessons to be learned? Like any institution, you know, I, I believe very much that institutions are creatures of their history. The Maastricht Treaty says what it says because it was a creature of the times. At that time, after the Keynesian excesses of the 70s and 80s, it seems that the Bundesbank model was nirvana. I mean, just, you know, to achieve price stability, control inflation, have an entity that, like Ulysses at the Mass, will tie the hands so the government can say to the different interest groups, you know, so you can see that that has changed, of course, but that was the story of the times. 
So uh, the, the, the U.S. has its system is completely a result of its type. So just very briefly, uh, on the left is insurance and pension funds. On the middle is banking, <coughs> banking mostly as commercial banking as well as thrifts, the different types of entities in the U.S., like saving and loan associations, credit unions, which are regarded as thrifts, like our saving banks or spark cash or cajas de ahorro, those are, all that is in the middle. And then to the right, eh, the securities markets. And the, the, the dividing line is the extent to which the federal level prevails or the state level prevails. And so what you can see, and this, this helps to understand, I have now put the FSOC on top of everything, because the FSOC is supposed to be on top of everything, top of the state and the federal, the insurance, the banking, and the securities. And I will come back to this, but it's important to understand this complexity. So the, if we start with the easy part, which is insurance, in the U.S., insurance is a matter of a state law, for the most part. There is now a provision under Dodd Frank that says that any entity that is deemed to be systemically significant by FSOC, including insurance, will be put under the supervision of the Fed, including also a hedge fund or a private equity fund, any entity. It will be put under the supervision of the Federal, I think it's section 113 of the Dodd Frank Act. Will be put under the, the remit of the Federal Resource System to be supervised. The lesson being, if I'm going to assist you on a rainy day, I need to know what's happening on a sunny day. Any entity. So that actually kind of breaks, is the, the one rule that breaks the whole system. And then also will be put under the Orderly Liquidation Authority, OLA, which is the, the entity is the FDIC. So, so that will transfer anything from the left to the right to the middle and put it under FED and FDIC. Ed for supervision and provision of lender of last resort and FDIC for the re resolution procedure. And then to the, to the right, to the very right, what we have is that actually when it comes to, to securities, in the U.S., the prevalence is of the federal level. So an insurance is almost exclusively national law, state law, as they say in the U.S., and on, 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 on securities is for the most part, federal level. And at the federal level, we have the, 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 the famous SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, and we have also FINRAM, which took away from, took the powers from the National Association of Securities Dealers, so FINRA being like the, the, the own self-regulatory group of the financial industry regulatory authority, and then of course we have the regulation of the exchanges. We also have that in Europe the New York Stock Exchange and others, and the Commodities and Future Trading Commission. But, but where the, 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 the key thing is in the middle, because this is the situation in Europe at the moment. Well, in Europe, we have, so if we were to put this chart in Europe, in Europe, we have the prevalence of the national level in both securities and insurance, because the, both the ESMA, with the exception of credit rating agencies, and IOPA, in the European Insurance and Occupational Funds Authority, they, 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 they have a, an important role, but, but the actual supervision of the entities still takes place at the national level. So we, 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 we can call it it's a process of federalization, but not centralization. And, but in, in Europe, we have actually a similar situation emerging on the, on the banking side. On the banking side, in the US, is the prevalence of the federal level, but the state level remains also important. So, is a, so while in securities is a total prevalence, this is a relative prevalence. And in, and in insurance, nothing or very little. ERISA is for pension funds, no, not, not for insurance companies. So, and I'm not going to talk about ERISA today. So the Federal Research System, which was set up in 1913, amended several times. The three days there I have put, or because in 1956, uh, the, the Fed was amended to create, uh, under the Bank Holding Company Act, the Fed is always in charge of the holding entity. So for instance, JP Morgan may have the depositor institution subject to the OCC, but the holding company of JP Morgan, very important these days for single point of entry and all those things, is supervised by the Fed. 
So as the same entity can obviously be supervised by different authorities, as we do now in Europe. So for instance, just continuing with JP Morgan, JP Morgan. So the depositor institution will be supervised by OCC. If it gets into trouble, will be FDIC. The Fed supervises the holding company as well as consolidated supervision. If it does derivatives trade, will be Commodities and Future Trading Commission on top of everything else. And as a public limited company, will also be obviously reporting uh, to, to SEC. So you see here the, the interplay between the different agencies. And the, the, so I think this is symptomatic to see that a lot of the changes that have taken place in the US, as, as in here, is response to crisis, creatures of its history, but a very complex structure. This professor, who is now a colleague of mine, Howell Jackson, just before the crisis, he came to, to give a talk in London, and he was saying that all these uh, should be you know, changed to just have one financial service authority, like a that time we had in the UK. Obviously, things have changed a lot since then, and we seem to be moving in the twin peaks or, or multiple peaks. So in Europe, this is what we know that we have. So this is the, the, the famous interplay between the two jurisdictional domains, the uh, single market and the eurozone. And the, so this is the structure we established for the single market for the whole EU with the European Systemic Risk Board. There you have the general board and the voting members and non-voting members. The relationship between macro pru and micro pru. There are different charts that will show to you this thing. And you can, don't necessarily need to be put one above and the other below. It's just one way, it's not that macro pru. Effectively, as, as I just saw in the, in the next slide, the European Systemic Risk Board is a little bit of a non-entity because it doesn't really have legal powers, it doesn't have legal personality. So it has you know, powers of suasion and powers of recommendation and a glorified think tank, but it doesn't really have the powers. And that's, that's, that's one of the constraints of the construction of the European Systemic Risk Board. The FSOC has real, real powers. So, and then we have Banking Union, to which a few of the, the, the <coughs> presentations today and tomorrow will refer to. So I will, not, I will not mention it, other than since I was asked to compare the, the two models across the Atlantic, particularly the ESRV and the, and the FSOC, which is the model in the US. Uh, you know, the, the, to some extent, if one looks at it, you know, Forget about Brexit. If one looks at it, trying to put a positive, optimistic view on what can lie ahead, if one looks at this, one can see that this process of banking union, to some extent, replicates what happened in the US. So in the US, before, before 1913, everything was state level. So in the US, uh, the first thing that was, that was centralized at the federal level was the supervision and provision of liquidity assistance for commercial banks. So that's what the 1913 Act did. The 1913 Act established lender of large resort, the discount window lending, and established supervision. FMOC was only created in 1933, so open market operations came actually later. So the first policy was the discount window. So in the same way as it took 20 years to move from what we call the pillar, an incomplete pillar one of banking union to what will be resolution effectively, the FDAC established this special bank insolvency proceeding, which is the equivalent to resolution these days. I mean, mutatis mutandis doesn't have the same resolution tools that we have, but it had already some that we could classify as resolution tools. It took 20 years, so from 1913 to 1933. So sometimes, trying to put a positive glare on everything that we say is that we have started our journey in Europe. We'll just get there, just, yes, just give us time. Things cannot happen immediately. Neither they happen immediately in the process of federalization and centralization in the US. <coughs> and yes, you can still have segmentation. I mean, the US has segmentation. Most of it is at the national level. I will not talk because this is not a presentation about the missing pillars, but at least you see them. Obviously, lender of large resort to me is a missing pillar in the building, and I've written and talked about that extensively. And then, obviously, fiscal union dooms in, the, in, in it, you know, it's always in the background. Why? We know why because if fiscal funds are at the stake, you know, the U.S. always has the treasury behind. 
in the Bank of England, you also have the Treasury. In Europe, there is not this counterparty yet. There have been a lot of efforts with the two-pack and the six-pack and other things, but we're not there yet. So now we move um, to, to talk a little bit about the Eurozone, and then I'm going to compare the three systems. So this is the status quo. So responsibility for macro pru is shared between the ECB, Article 5 of the SSM regulation, national authorities or councils of financial stability, and the ESRB, European Systemic Risk Board, bearing in mind that the ESRB is a bit of a non-entity because it doesn't have legal personality, not legal powers. And a, a EBA report on the subject of July 2015 on what the authorities had reported that was taking place in terms of macro pru, the, the reporting, and, and maybe Anna, you were involved with that, it says that the ESRB provided, is quoted at the end of the presentation, this report, provided the general analytical advice, like a template, an intellectual template to look at the issues. Well, that's my reading of it. And then the competent or designated authorities took the actual decisions, because those have the legal powers, and uh, the macroprudential measures to apply, and EBA attempted to coordinate. But now the situation has changed. So we still have the national authorities. We have, of course, the ESRB. Remember that the ESRB was set up how it was set up, in part because of the opposition of the UK government to have another entity placed at the ECB when, after all, the euro, sorry, the, the, the sterling pound was not part of the euro. But anyway, that's a different story. So, so Article 5 has now given macroprudential powers with regard to the uh, uh, implementation of some uh, uh, capital requirements, further capital requirements. And so what we have in the EU is a very important need for coordination. Whether EBA alone can do that role is something that at least has to be questioned. I'm not saying yes or no, but it has to be questioned because the ECB is really in charge of the powers that it has been given, but the national authorities also are in charge. <laughs> and then we have the ESRB providing this template. So this is, perhaps we can discuss it in the questions and answers. So these, these tables compare the three, the three models. So just looking at the mandate instruments and then uh, governance, information, advantages, challenges. So very quickly, because I have already explained it and I know time is, is you can see that the mandate is uh, kind of similar across the three uh, entities. Is this prevention, monitoring, containment of systemic risk, resilience, so the, the definitional issues that we touched at the beginning is the essence of these macroprudential bodies. Where, where there is huge differences in the powers. So when we start looking at the powers, the, the, so the key difference is, of course, that the ESRB, because of the ECB, National uh, Councils of Financial Stability, it doesn't have formal powers to make binding decisions. The uh, FSOC has very important powers. To me, one of the most important powers is the one I mentioned before, which is not written there. This power to any institution that is deemed to be systemically significant will be put by order of the FSOC under the supervision of the Fed and the resolution authority of OLA, the orderly liquidation authority placed within FDIC. That's a very, very important power. So if you're a hedge fund, if you're an insurance company, you don't want to be in that list. And there has already been litigation in the US with regard to MetLife. They don't want to be in that list. They don't want to be. So the entity doesn't want to be impose further supervision, capital requirements. To be in that list is not a nice thing from the perspective of the entity. So obviously, the, 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 from the perspective of the authorities is that if you're too big, too significant, too whatever to fail, we need to keep an eye on you. From the perspective of the entities is I'm not, you know, I'm a hedge fund, I can just, you know, close my positions and that. So there is this tension, isn't it? Tension which in the US will always lead to litigation. In the case of the FPC, it has very important uh, powers of recommendation and direction. The governance structure, again, don't be misled by the 38 voting members. The, given that it doesn't have formal powers and, and, and it does have all these different entities that everyone needs to have, to have a say, in the end, it doesn't really do very much. And um, 
I mean, it does a lot in providing an intellectual template, but I'd like to emphasize the lack of legal powers. Then the information of collection of statistical analysis, that's where they rely, that's important, you know, because supervision is above all about collecting adequate information in order to make the decisions. So the supervisor's job, as well as the IMF, when it exercises surveillance, what it wants to do is gather adequate information. Is the system really bad or is the bank really bad or not? Then the advantages, this is actually these answers to the title that I was given, all regulatory bodies under the single watch of this supra entity can bring institutions under the scope of federal oversight because of this section 113. In the case of the European Systemic Risk Board, it fills a vacuum in the EU by monitoring macroprudential supervision. And in the, in the case of the Financial Policy Committee, can implement special macroprudential tools. Obviously, a very important part in the country where I now live, you know, the ability to impose higher capital requirements or loan-to-value ratios or loan-to-income ratios or some other counter-cyclical measures. Challenges in the U.S. I'm not going to talk about Trump, but Trump is a challenge, you know. So you can put there the, the regulatory landscape remains complex and the things can change, regulation can change. In the EU, the challenge is, yeah, this lack of powers, isn't it? And then uh, in, the, in, the, in the UK, it's because of, of this complex setting that they have. So they, they replace a system. You know, in, in the US, there was a book written immediately after the crisis that said, end the Fed. In the Bank of England, sorry, in the UK, since the FSA was in charge, it's end the FSA. So whoever was in charge of supervising, you know, got really very bad press and, you know, and, and got at least the pressure to do that. But whether the new system in the UK is the best remains to be seen. Um, I'm going to finish. Uh, I'm not going to go through the last slices, which are the, the challenges for the ECB, and also, for me, the opportunities that Capital Markets Union also presents in this particular area. But I'll leave that for you to read. I'll finish with this a slide of the, one of my favorites of the little prince of Antoine de saint exupery and is the image of the Baobabs. And I write there in blue that the international dimension and the consideration of CFIs are really behind this image of the Baobabs. And that given the interconnection between banking markets and other markets that I have not discussed today, sovereign in debt, derivatives, and the designations of CFIs, the limits of the financial stability mandate remain open. So this image is, is how to supervise, and is the analogy with CIFIS. And so there are these terrible seeds on the planet that was the home of the little prince, and these are the seeds of the baobab. And now baobab is something that you will never be able to get rid of if you attend to it too late. You know, too big to fail, too systemic to fail, too important, too complex, too politically connected, too important to jail, all the variations are there. And if the plan is too small, these countries, including the UK, that, you know, if the, the size of the GDP is dwarfed by the size of the banking system, case of Iceland, case of Ireland. So if the planet is too small and the baobabs are too many, they split it into pieces, or you call the IMF and the ESM. And after explaining how he cleaned the seas of the baobabs every day, he added, sometimes there is no harm in putting a piece of work until another day. But when it is a matter of baobabs, read CIFIS, that always means a catastrophe. The danger of the baobabs is so little understood, and this is what we are, and such considerable risk would be run by anyone who might get lost on an asteroid, very valid image, that for once I'm breaking through my reserve, and I tell you plainly, watch out for the baobabs, watch out for the CIFIs. And we are still not sure of how best to tackle the problem of the CIFIs. I said I was going to finish with this, but I'll say one more thing. I, I had earlier last week, uh, Professor Charles Goodhart come and teach my students. And towards the end of the class, he expressed a concern that had nothing to do with my subject today, but uh, it has to do with this idea of, of, of too big to jail. has to do with, he, he was very critical of the, uh, of the decision by the, as you know, the US Department of Justice to impose this massive fine on Deutsche Bank. And he was very critical because he said that we, we need to get a proper understanding of what are individual sanctions and institutional sanctions. 
So institutional sanctions penalize the institution, while the personal sanctions actually can put people to jail or put people out of work. And so he was saying that what we need to, to move is, is to a better system in which we have a better system of sanctioning at the personal level rather than sanctioning at the institutional level. It's true the words misdeed, it's true that things were done wrongly. Is that, is that the right medicine to penalize the bank or the banking system as a whole for the misdeeds of a few? And I leave again the thought because it, 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 it made me think about this, which has been much more talked about in the US than here, this too big to jail. That there was really very great cases of hugely incompetent management that the role of shareholders is often overstated given the relationship that they have with managers in banks and in a banking crisis. And that therefore we, we needed a new template for sanctioning that would not jeopardize the system. And that template would in include that, particularly with regard to CIFIS, just because of the danger that they pose to the system, we need to also a, a have a, a culture of enforcement that actually penalizes those managers that were at the helm of the institution when some of those uh, very uh, excessively risky decisions were taken. So thank you very much.